Friday. We're going to run late. Run by 11.15, because I know you guys have been itchy to get out of here. Uh, I'm aware of the problem, and I will do the best I can to correct it, starting uh, Thursday. Hello, Houston. I'm sitting here house tending, um, as I seem to be doing most of the time these days. But in any case, um, what I wanted to do is kind of pick up, I kind of left you in the wilderness last time, and I want to uh, kind of clean up what we were talking about and then move from there into where I was headed with that uh, August uh, introduction that I was giving to you last time. Um, it had to do with the fact that I was really posing a series of problems to you. Um, and that is essentially looking at a rather interesting book by Cerise a number of years back in terms of really kind of addressing the issue, who are you? What, is, what's, what are the ways in which we can look at yourself? And it turns out there are a lot of different ways in, in which that can be done. Um, some of the most obvious ones are to simply look at the physical self. That's what you see when you're shaving in the morning or when you're looking at, at uh, the mirror to do makeup and that kind of thing. That's the physical thing that the rest of us look at. But that has a lot of different information that it can give to you. Um, whether you're hot or nervous or cold, all of those are ultimately registered internally first. That is, you're the first one that's aware of it before uh, the rest of us become aware that, gee, he's sweating or whatever happens to be happening. So the, the physical self provides us with a lot of information that we can then use in terms of, of um, various other things, such as, for instance, the social self. Um, think about it for a minute. Look at all the different things that you get interacting with or that impact the way in which you interact with people when you're in a social situation. There are, of course, the normal social processes, the hi, how are you, or good to see you, or whatever we do as we're passing each other in the hallway. And that goes on in about half a second, maybe a second of interaction, not much more. Uh, witness the fact that if you say to somebody as you're passing a good friend or something lousy, uh, oftentimes they will have already said, oh, good as you're passing before they actually catch that you said lousy and therefore oh good isn't the appropriate response in that situation. So in essence there are a lot of different rules that go into the social processes we, we get ourselves engaged in and the skills that we develop in, in doing them. Um, we define things like friends socially basically. One fascinating study that was done over 50 years ago that I, I just tripped across was done by Kuhn and Part McPartland back in 1954. A very simple study, the kind of thing you kind of sit at your desk trying to create for yourself. Um, but in essence, what he did was to simply summarize various people's responses to a very simple question, and that is, who are you? I left you at the end of the last program with that as a challenge. Did you come up with an answer? And let me show you what he found. What he found was that the single most often given type of response to the question when somebody asks you, who are you, is a, a, a definition based on things like, um, I'm a student, I'm a junior, I'm a Democrat. Or, again, depending on the context, you might hear an answer like, I'm a Presbyterian, or a Catholic, or whatever. But it's only after that role is specified that they then get on to, to different kinds of attributes uh, to discuss traits like, I'm dependable, I'm studious, I'm gregarious or antagonistic or assertive. That's the proper word to use, not, not, a, not aggressive, assertive. But it's interesting that, that the first thing we tend to specify when, when somebody asks you, well, who are you? Well, I'm a, and we name a role. I found that a kind of a fascinating observation that we tend to get into that before we get into the things that, that ultimately impact how people uh, uh, most often uh, classify us, and that is in terms of being dependable, studious, uh, reliable, and so forth and so on. So what that leads to is, is essentially uh, another element of, of self that I wanted to talk about, and that is essentially self-concept, because now we're beginning to start a, start a little bit of interaction or, or let that interaction impact how we, how we view ourselves. Um, essentially, that's your own view of you. What is your self-concept? And in answering that question, we essentially um, are, are responding to or, or summarizing the kind of things we've already been talking about, basically. Um, you and I both have friends whose self-concept may be right on target. That is, they know who they are, they know how, they, how they're received, how best to present themselves, and they kind of interact in, in, a, in a logical way with, with the world. But on the other hand, I'm sure you know other people 
whose self-concept is way off target. I mean, they don't have a clue how people are interacting, how they're receiving the interactions that people offer, um, that, that they offer their friends. Um, but that, that kind of self-concept, whatever it may be, whether it's right on target or way off, uh, clearly influences both our thoughts and our behaviors. But it does impact um, the next element that I, that I also wanted to mention here, and that is the ideal self, okay? What do you really want to be when you grow up? And that's a question that, that we all face all the way through our life, basically. But it's implicit in, in your life that you're not where you're headed, or you wouldn't be in college. I mean, the very idea that you're in college is to say that your vision of ideal self is not what you ultimately want it to be. You haven't reached that state yet, in all likelihood. And what that leads to as a kind of a summary statement here is that what I'm going to propose um, is essentially that the self is more than any one element of what I'm, what I'm talking about there. You could really conceptualize it as a process. Self as process is, is the idea that I want to leave you with. And the idea that there are lots of things going on inside of us at any given time and between us and other people as we're interacting also at any given time. We're going to be covering various aspects of, the, of that interactive process uh, during the course of, of the, the rest of this course. We're going to look at a lot of different elements of, of who you and I are, how we evolved or developed into who we now are. So if you encounter a problem in this course that you're enrolled in, the nature of the problem may differ whether you're in math or in a language course or a behavioral science course, but how you deal with it involves you, essentially. It involves your emotions. Uh, your thoughts, your behavior, all of those are, are elements of what you are. And that's really viewing yourself as a process that is given what you're, what you're stuck in at the moment or, or the environment in which you're trying to interact. That really impacts who you are as in a, in a process suggested by Calhoun and Asacella. I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly, Acacella. Uh, in an earlier text that was focused on psychology of adjustment um, some years back, um, about 30 years ago now. And we're going to be taking a kind of an interactive approach on, on, to, on the various elements of you and I that impact who we ultimately are, what our self looks like from the inside and from the view of others. Um, and then I want to pick up on, on essentially what we were talking about last time, and that has to do with essentially um, the issue of development in, in one of the ways in which I want to look at that, and that is to consider the concept of stages, which we were just getting into last time. Um, I'm going to redefine it for you, but I want, to, I want to also pose a problem for you. Let me go ahead and give you the, um, the, what I was talking about there, and that is the, essentially the time period during which you exhibit certain typical behavior patterns and gain specific abilities. Now, I raised for you uh, several different issues around the, the idea that we can actually name a stage and develop stage theories of this, that, or the other thing. Um, one of the problems is that stage theories tend to ignore the large individual differences in human development. For instance, the different speeds with which we move through childhood, infancy, adolescence, and so forth in the various stages of adulthood. And the, the, the related problem there is that the age ranges for specific events are becoming wider and wider. Um, if you think about a, a fairly isolated concept like adolescence, which we'll be defining pretty precisely here a little bit later, um, the age range of that is, is down as far as four or five in some of the things that we normally associate with adolescence in some people. And it may not show up in others until their early 20s. So the, the, whether you're an early maturer or a late maturer and so forth, all of that goes back to influence that self-concept. But it leads to um, the process that I do want to talk about. I want to talk about essentially process-oriented theories um, of human development and, and start with a, with a stage theory as an example here, defining it as on the screen there. Um, and so basically what I'm going to lead into here is a, um, a process-oriented theory, as you'll see in just a minute. And I'm going to define that essentially as a time period during which you exhibit certain typical behavior patterns and gain specific abilities. That's what a time a process-oriented theory is predicated upon, that, that very concept, the idea that, that we have particular areas of our lives that we can focus on and isolate and study as a unit, as an independent functioning unit. It's probably over-optimistic, overly optimistic, such theories. 
but they organize large amounts of data and point out new avenues for research to pursue. That's the general function of a theory. And process theories are, are stage theories, I should say, are, are kind of unique in, in the, the way in which they package or, or predict that we are in fact going to be organized specifically. One of the best examples in, in all of uh, both personality and, and the study of development, um, of course, of a stage theory is, is the cognitive or stage theory of Jean Piaget. Um, it was originally a theory of cognitive development. That was the primary thing that he was focusing on when he studied uh, his children. Um, and he reached a remarkably complex decision that is essentially, his view of it was that children are simply small adults. Um, that they, they operate with the same basic rules that we do and, and thus his theory is kind of predicated around uh, trying to identify the different stages and the operating rules at each of the ages as we grow into um, adulthood. He argued essentially that children think consistently but differently from adults. Um, and, and there is some, some, uh, some wisdom to that kind of observation, but they do in fact think consistently. Um, if you think about um, some of the classic demonstrations that Piaget has, has uh, um, argued for or, or presented to us over, over the years, he's posed some rather interesting problems there. But basically that theory of his is, is based on our ability to organize, to order and to classify new concepts in the mind. These things are called schemata, okay? That's what his theory is built around. And it's our ability then to adapt adjustments or, or changes in, in a mental concept as we gain knowledge. So as we move into a stage, we use very consistent orders of uh, rules of processing of the information that is heaped upon us or that we experience. And one of two things happens typically in each of the stages of his theory, and there are two kind of central concepts that, that we're going to talk about here. One is the idea of assimilation. That's a, a, a fundamental process that he identifies in our ability simply to adapt, to adjust or change to a mental concept. In uh, Adjustment or change in a mental concept is what I should say here. And the adaptation he's going to be talking about is based on two processes, the first and most fundamental of which is assimilation. That is what he's arguing there is that, that that involves perceiving and interpreting new information in terms of extant concepts and understandings. Clearly, in that kind of an approach, what he's really arguing is that, that you're using current knowledge. You're using that to interact with and understand the world and, and process whatever events you get caught in. You react in terms of your past experience. You're simply processing it or assimilating it into the cognitive structure you've already got. You've developed rules of, of, uh, rules of interaction for mom and dad, and brother and sister, and so forth, and, and you simply, in, in normal, everyday interaction, are engaged in nothing more than what Piaget calls assimilation, when you're simply factoring that or monitoring that, that interaction by simply using the current rules, operating as you currently understand it. But that doesn't leave room for growth. And in fact, Piaget's theory is very much about growth and development. And so he introduced a second very important central concept, if you want to think of it that way, that he called accommodation. And that is where you're actually restructuring mental organizations or concepts so as to include new information. This is the more advanced form of adaptation. Because now what you're doing is taking whatever experiences you're involved in and finding that they don't fit going back to that critical thinking model that we were talking about a couple of programs ago. Um, and in fact, the result of that is that you then accommodate, you adjust your mental structure in some way or another based on newer, ev newer evidence, newer information that you've gained in one way or another, um, and, and make the necessary adjustments so that the next time you're faced with this new situation, you essentially know how to react to it. And that's the, those are the two fundamental concepts on which his, his theory of, of cognitive development, his stage theory, Piaget's stage theory, is in fact based. And in terms of that theory, he basically identified four primary stages that we tend to move through, we meaning humans, tend to, um, tend to move through. The first of those he labeled simply as sensory motor. Um, and he thought it existed, predicted that it ex existed, basically from birth to about two years of age. Uh, now clearly, a two-year-old is capable of doing a lot of stuff that a, that a just-born person isn't. Um, but in fact, um, 
through that time period, uh, zero to two years of age, you've got primitive reflex activity that's very prominent in that case. Uh, there's a growing sensory motor awareness, not only what's going on in the world, but the fact that you can impact it as you're waving your hands, touching it, squeezing it, tickling it, doing whatever, okay? There's little distinction in that case between the self and the environment, okay? The, the world in which we operate is as one with our own head, essentially, during the sensory motor stage. By the end of this stage, we have developed a concept called object permanence. If you've ever played with a zero to two year old youngster uh, on the living room floor, you're on the rug or something and you're playing with it with a toy and you're interacting with the youngster and the toy, if you put that toy around behind their back, even if they're distracted for a minute so they don't see your move actually putting your hand around behind your back, still when their tension comes back to the area where you were working, they will miss the object. That is, it will be, you know, where to go? What is it? not in the sophisticated language I'm using, but in essence the, 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 the object itself that you've been playing with has permanence, so that whether it's there or not, there is a, a, a representation of it in, within the, the um, mental structure of, of the youngster. So that if, if you put it away, even if you hide a, you know, a ball or something by your hand and put it, move it behind, they still know that the ball has gone with your hand and will therefore crawl, crawl around behind you. It's a game for them, but they are still pursuing the object that they know continues to exist. And that's what we mean by, by object permanence, that, that whether it's present or not, it does still exist in the, um, in the world. Um, that in turn leads into a second stage called pre-operational, which he thought, uh, labeled as, as pre-operational, that he thought basically ran from roughly ages two to age seven. And what you're seeing here are several processes going on simultaneously. One is, is an increase in, in language, not only use but complexity, um, and concept development. It's a very egocentric stage. The world tends to operate entirely in terms of the youngster's view of that world. They cannot take another perspective in that case. Thinking, for instance, tends to be intuitive as opposed to logical. Uh, it's impulsive. Even by the end of this stage, it does not yet, such an individual does not yet understand the conservation of matter. I came within about uh, a split second today of being able to have a youngster, a five-year-old here to demonstrate for you what is called conservation of matter. Um, you've seen the, the uh, classic demonstration of that, and let me see if I can do a, a screen illustration of it. Starting with, for instance, uh, a jar, you're going to see a problem with this in a minute, the reason I so wanted to use a live child for it. But in essence, if we start with two jars of fluid like that, um, it's equal to a second one, and in fact, in doing the demonstration, it's very helpful if you start with something that can be seen, whether it's Kool-Aid or Coke or milk or something that has color to it. Start with a vial already filled, and then challenge the youngster with a, with a jar to fill the other one till it's got the same amount so that they do understand it and can demonstrate by pouring in an additional amount of milk or fussing because they've over poured and then pouring out. But in essence, using the youngster, his or her own behavior, to essentially demonstrate that they understand the idea of equality. And so we're going to pour the fluid into that second vial until it equals, until it's exactly the same as the first vial. And then you ask them, if I take this one, do you want to take that one? Or could I take that one and you take this one? And you get them to agree behaviorally, essentially, that they're equal. It really, it doesn't matter whether I take it or you take it. So there is a, an understanding there of, of conservation of, of matter by that point, or sorry, the, the object permanence, the equality of the two concepts. Now what we're gonna do is tip their world a little bit. Well, I'll actually tip one of the vials and now you'll see the problem that I have. And that is this particular fluid that I'm pouring has a remarkable ability to stick in the bottom of the vial that I'm using. So roll with me here, assume that it's beginning to tip. <laughs> Could not figure out a way to illustrate that with PowerPoint. So in any case, we simply tip it over. And when we get to the point where, where it's uh, pouring sideways, we're then gonna fill that fluid in another vial. And as you may understand, the vial that we're using is going to be narrower, not as big cross-section, doesn't have its diameter as big, but it's going to be taller. And in fact, right in front of the youngster, we'll take one of those two vials that through his or her own behavior, they have demonstrated that they understand that it's the same amount. It doesn't matter who takes which vial. And then you take one of those vials of fluid and pour it into the other cylinder, <coughs> which cylinder has a less broad, is a smaller diameter, and it's taller. But right in front of the child, you pour it in. 
And then you face them with this kind of a situation. Okay, we've now poured that fluid into this vial. Which one would you like? Would you like the one on this side? And I'll give you that, and I'll take this one on the other side. Or would you like the one that I'm take, trying to take, and you have the other one? Anywhere in the world, worldwide, kids will always reach for the tall vial. Age five, they always reach for the tall vial. And that was really the kind of the solidity of the kind of observations that Piaget made about children, cognitive development, and so forth and so on. There is something in us related to the conservation of matter that intellectually we simply do not yet understand in the middle of, of the pre-operational stage. In fact, throughout the pre-operational stage, we really do not yet understand the principle of conservation of matter. That once that, you know, we may have the idea of object permanence and essence can exist. We might even put that vial of milk behind us and they'll crawl around looking for it. So the, the, the object itself has permanence. But the, the fluid, the, the characteristics of a fluid, they simply do not understand. And so when you pour that same vial right in front of the child into another size container, if one dimension changes substantially, that's the one they will identify with. Um, other work has suggested that probably the reason we get that effect is because of the fact that the change in height is much more obvious here than is the change in, in, um, in width, the, or the, the loss of width, basically. And so where the width is, is, is declining slightly, the height is changing substantially. More, ob more observably, and that's probably what tricks the youngster in, into not realizing that in fact it's the very same fluid in both cases. But the, the, the intriguing thing about that demonstration is essentially the idea that you can pose that question, that, that demonstration, to any child in the world, and it does not matter their background. They always go for the taller vial. When I asked, you know, which of the two would you like to have, they will always opt for the taller one. They have lost track of the fact that in gaining height, they've lost width, and therefore it's the same substance. They do not yet understand conservation of matter. In turn, then, this leads to a, a, uh, another stage. Didn't realize I had a fancy indicator there. That's the one they choose. Um, that leads, in turn, into what's called a concrete operational stage, roughly ages 7 to 11, um, by which time the, the conservation of matter has been mastered in this case. Um, and um, the reversibility of certain mental operations has become increasingly apparent to them. Cognition is, is largely tied to the physical world here. Objects can be ordered by physical characteristics. For instance, if you show them uh, three dolls or pictures of three friends who happen to differ by, say, six inches between the shortest, the middle one, and the tallest one, they can very easily put them in order uh, based on height, no problem in that case, in, in, the, um, in the third stage, the, the concrete operational stage. Those physical features are now quite easy to manipulate. They could do it based on weight, a little tougher, but they could do it based on weight. They could do it on age. All of those are concepts that are still physically tied to the real world, but in fact they could use them then to logically order them in any particular sequence. Finally then, the last stage that we get to is the formal operational stage. That runs from 11 to 15. Now what we're beginning to see are abstract thinking, uh, scientific reasoning appears. Um, there is a kind of an underlying logic that can be manipulated. That is, you can, you can argue with a youngster uh, at, uh, well, a, a, a fellow human at age 11 to 15 based on logic, the, the logic of, of what you're, you're talking about here. The problems themselves are approached logically and with reason, and, and a youngster at this age is capable of what's called a what-if operation. That is, even looking at an object, you can, you can um, well, going back to the, the jar example I used a little bit earlier, if you were to, t to present a, a, a young teenager with two vials of fluid that are exactly the same, um, and then say to them, what if I were to pour this one vial into a cylinder like this and show them the target vessel, um, would there be more or less fluid? And in that case, they are intellectually capable of, of reasoning that, in fact, pouring it from one to the other may change the shape, but it doesn't change the content. They have then mastered uh, the, the constancy of, of uh, magnitude in, in that case. So the latter stage, formal operations, has caused some problems for, for Piaget. Some adults never reach it. 
they mature through the three stages and never reach the point of, of actually being able to use logic and understand when logic dictates a different conclusion than in fact they've reached. Um, those who do usually reach it actually typically reach it later than Piaget actually projected. That stage doesn't have an upper limit of age 15 by any means. Uh, Patricia Arland in, in the mid-70s um, viewed formal operations as, as problem solving, that is, as essentially responding to questions by others. Um, and that, that posing of, of uh, that as a kind of an explanation of the fourth stage leads to a rather interesting implication I'll get to here in just a second. But she basically proposes the existence of higher level people whom she calls essentially problem finders not those based in formal operations, but problem finders. Teachers would be a good example of problem finders. People who can ask new questions, take whatever's existing now and lead to new and additional uh, potential questions. What she's essentially arguing um, in that is that there may be a fifth case, a, a fifth stage in, in um, um, Piaget's work. And the implication of that is that if not everybody reaches the formal operation stage, it's for sure that an even smaller number of people are actually going to reach the, the problem posing stage, where, you, where you're to the point where you understand a given concept to the point where you can start asking questions or teaching about it, um, posing new questions or, or reformulating it in, in a given way uh, to, to increase people's ability to, to understand it and so forth. So in fact, um, Piaget's work raises a very, a very interesting series of, of not unsolvable but intriguing problems in terms of cognitive development. That in turn leads us then into another kind of theory dealing with um, personality development and that is essentially the work of, of Eric Erickson. Uh, Freud's theory of psychoanalysis, as we're going to review later, had how many stages of personality development? That's a review question. How many stages? No, we're talking about Freud. No, there are five stages of existence. There are only four stages out of which you develop, if you think about it. There are four stages of development because oral, anal, phallic, latent, and genital. Um, if you end up in the genital stage, you do not develop out of that. So that, in some sense, is not really thought of as, as a developmental stage. It's an end stage. It is the stage into which we grow. Um, and, but that's so, in, in one sense, you could argue, and it's a petty argument, but you could really talk about oral anal phallic, oral anal phallic latent, and gen, uh, latent through latent being developmental. But genital is really an end state if you want to uh, couch the world simply in terms of Freud's views of, of psychoanalytic stages. But he viewed each stage, Freud, viewed each stage as a balancing act, as you know, between too much happiness, um, sex, and too much sadness, aggression. And that was the balance, the trigger point the, that, uh, that he was trying to work on with, with uh, developing healthy and effective humans. Um, Erickson, on the other hand, who is a preeminent psychoanalytic scholar, viewed the problem in a very different and intriguingly different way. He viewed life as, as essentially offering us a, a series of challenges through which, um, throughout the course of our life, not ending at, at late adolescence in moving into adulthood, he suggested actually there are challenges and problems that move beyond that and that we work on. Uh, he asserted basically that a child is socialized in a given culture as he or she passes through not four but eight innately psychosocial stages of development based on which problem he or she is actually working on. He was trained originally, Erickson, as an anthropologist and he credited society with posing a series of problematic challenges to its individual members, us humans. Crises or challenges um, to which each of us has to respond in one way or another, effectively or ineffectively depending. How we do so really determines the personality that each of us ends up with. Um, the entire sequence of challenges and, and the ages at which Erickson thought they were experienced is um, summarized in the following table. Uh, you may have seen elements of this before, but let's just go over it and, and look, concentrate particularly on the crises that we're dealing with at any given time. Um, the oral stage of Freud becomes essentially the stage of, of trust versus mistrust um, for Erickson. His first era, first, first problem challenge that we have to face as a, as a wee one is, is essentially 
whether in fact we can trust the world. Is mom to be trusted? Is dad to be trusted? Are my needs going to be met? Is really the fundamental issue that's involved there. And in that case, uh, Erickson was campaigning for the fact that you want to you want to work with with anyone to develop a sense of trust. That is, that they they need to be able to count on how they can how they can uh, interact with you um, for food, for water, for anything. Um, the second stage then. Uh, is again paralleling Freud, basically ages two to three, one to three, if you want to argue it that way, um, where the focal point, the, what you're, what you're, the issue that you're dealing with is essentially autonomy versus shame and doubt. Those may be kind of extreme, but they're kind of the, the ends of a, of a, of a scale. Uh, the idea being that, that what we're trying to do in, in youngsters at age one to three is basically to encourage exploration. The idea there is to foster autonomy, is to develop in them the idea that, that um, they can control the world. They're they are able to take advantage of it. Um, my um, ex-wife and I, when we had two children, four and seven, used to be lucky enough because we had rich in-laws. Uh, well, I had in-laws, she had parents, but they were well off. And so we would get flown um, to Boston at Christmas time. It was fun. I mean, it, it was a nice trip. But it was intriguing to me to watch the way other parents dealt with their children in an airliner. Because an airliner is one of those things where you really have to have things kind of tightly under control all the time. But even in airport lounges, you see the same kind of thing. And that is, our philosophy was always kids are kids. And so we would get them into an area where they could crawl around on their hands and knees and raise heck if they wanted to. And typically they didn't because, you know, they knew where they were headed and, and it was fun to be going to visit grandmother and, and grandfather. But our, our approach was really very uh, laissez-faire um, in terms of their activity at the time they were at the airport. Not because we weren't hands-on in terms, in terms of teaching them new things, but what that meant was that that sense of trust had basically developed. We trusted them and they trusted us. Um, and in fact, the result was that we didn't have to have them on a tight leash uh, in the airport. Uh, we could put them down and, and um, age three, four, five, we could trust them. You know, they would stick around us. They knew why it was important to do so. And that was the kind of thing that you get out of um, developing, first of all, the sense of trust and then encouraging in the youngster a sense of autonomy. They would occasionally see things that were interesting and ask to go visit it. We would either go over as a family or they would be, you know, trusted to go over there and, and take advantage of it. But that's what I mean essentially by autonomy, that the, they, they developed very effectively into youngsters who could control their own lives and, and could be trusted to do so um, in, in that second stage. So really you're, ex you're exploring, you're, you're concentrating on exploration to, to raise that kind of uh, an issue uh, and a net result. Third stage then for, for uh, Erickson is initiative versus doubt. Uh, running ages basically four to six, where now what you're beginning to do is, is to encourage self-initiated environmental exploration. We were a little ahead in, in doing that. But, but the initiative um, is, is self-generated, the idea that, you know, I control myself, I want to understand the world, and that kind of becomes the basis for that initiative that we're, that we're talking about there. Stage four, then, is industry versus inferiority. The latent stage in, in Freud. Is, is becoming essentially industry versus inferiority. Ages, uh, whoops, I'm ahead of myself. Yeah, ages six to puberty here, okay? This is the latent stage. This is kind of the middle Europeans ideal childhood. That is that nothing goes on from, from uh, the end of, of uh, early childhood until you're in an adolescence already. You don't think of sex, none of that happens, okay? It's just a flat stage, nothing's going on there. It's latent. But in fact, what, what um, Erickson was suggesting is that in fact what you're, what you're dealing with there is developing a sense of industry as opposed to inferiority. You manipulate to learn how things work and to develop a sense of industry, the idea that you can impact them in, in productive ways. Um, he's arguing that that goes on during elementary school, essentially later childhood. Leading then into stage, the fifth stage, which is of course adolescence, and there um, what you're essentially going to be doing is, is working on, on identifying who you are. I mean that becomes one of the central elements as we'll see in adolescence, developing a true and on target sense of identity. Who are you? Uh, as opposed to being controlled, uh, being con not controlled, confused by um, your role um, 
in life? That is, are you strictly a step and fetch it for your parents, or are you in fact using them as, as a stepping stone into your own life as you're going to, to develop that? And that's kind of what's involved in, in identity versus role confusion. You need to come to understand who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what you can alter, and so forth. So in essence, the, the, um, the kind of thing that can be done there is to develop an integrated sense of self that is personally acceptable and different from others. That is, you come to understand who you are um, and, and you're comfortable with it. And if you're not, you work on it. Um, this in turn leads then into adulthood and it's divided in a rather interesting way. That is, unlike Freud, who simply puts us into uh, the, the genital stage and then turns us loose. You know, whatever happens, happens. Um, a bit of an overstatement there. But, but um, what, what Erickson did was really f concentrate on adulthood also as another stage of, of development and suggest that there are really two different kinds of things going on early in adulthood as opposed to later on in adulthood. So in, in young adulthood, as he called it, essentially uh, up to, say, 25 to 45, um, what you're really working on is intimacy versus isolation. That is, are you going to in fact live alone or are you going to find a life partner? And, and essentially what you're developing is close and meaningful relationships with other people, given the practice that goes on during adolescence of, of many kind of cross-sex or same-sex um, matchings, um, you develop a, a better understanding of the kind of person with whom you're really going to be most comfortable. You're seeking ultimately, your kind of practice mating is what's going on during, during adolescence. That is, of course, a bit of an oversimplification, but granting me that. Young adulthood is really the only time when you actually face two different challenges simultaneously. That is, not only are you about the business of, of finding a life partner, or at least a, a uh, five-year, ten-year life partner, but you're also working on a career. And in, in terms of, of Erickson's model, that's the only time in, in life as he envisions it that you've actually, you're facing two challenges simultaneously. It is, as you might understand, a very busy time. Later adulthood, he identifies as essentially 45 to, to 65. And what's beginning to happen is that, that you're, you're and, and here we're beginning to get a little bit more totally theoretical in, in uh, Erickson's approach here. But what he's arguing essentially is that the, the key thing is essentially striking a balance between generativity and self-absorption. Some people simply grow into a, a greater and greater appreciation of themselves. I love me, and aren't I great, and, and so forth and so on. That would be essentially self-absorption, as, as he's defining it. And on the other hand, you have people that really move out into society um, and, and work for the, for the betterment of, of society itself. Houston has had a, a recent mayor uh, who I would suggest probably showed a great deal of that, that is in, in his governing of the, uh, of the city. Uh, he had a lot of outreach ideas in, in terms of, given where we are, what can we do for the betterment of, of the population as a whole? And I would say that that was really a, a socially oriented perspective rather than one very much wrapped up in himself. He didn't give the impression as he was in office that his, his major goal was to get to the next office but rather, what can we do while we're here? And that's the sense in which I mean um, the, the, um, um, the concentration on others is, is becoming more obvious in that case. Uh, so there is a concern about the future of, of the environment in which you find yourself and about the world as, as a whole. That's, that's a kind of an old adult, uh, older adult um, source of, of um, issues. And finally then, what that leads to is the, the, uh, the last stage in, in Erickson's theory, which is essentially from roughly 65, we might say essentially retirement, um, until death. Um, and if the previous stages have been resolved, um, you view life with, with dignity, you know, that is, it's been a satisfying effort. You can, you can kind of identify what your impact on it has been. There is out of that a growing sense of satisfaction and personal fulfillment. The life has been well lived. I've had this effect, I've had that effect, and so forth. Um, and Erickson would, would call that essentially striking a balance between integrity versus despair. That is, if the, the, the life has been well led, on the view of the individual, in the view of the individual mainly, um, the net result is that during old age, what you're, what you're really beginning to, to develop is a sense of satisfaction. I've had a positive, it's a good life, I've had a positive effect kind of approach. So the main issue there, the final one, is simply integrity, um, a, a sense of integration, of, of fulfillment, as opposed to despair. Uh, I've wasted my life kind of view. The primary drawback with Erickson's theory is simply the lack of empirical support. 
it's very difficult to take a broad stroke theory such as he's developed there and generate proof of it, to verify it. That's a problem. Nonetheless, adding in cultural factors to the biological ones has really broadened the, the appeal of, of Erickson's work relative to Freud's theory. He's really factored in his experiences from, from anthropology in a very productive way. He's, he's combined uh, the, the principles of psychology with some of the other more broad-reaching social sciences into a rather interesting theory. Now, in the interest of time, um, I'm not going to mention a number of other theories that we could jump into here, um, other perspectives on personal development, um, cognitive development. These would include things like learning theories, which I'm not going to get into, uh, ethological theories, um, humanistic theories, we may touch on those later, and various ecological theories. Those are kind of broad classes of theories that have also developed in the last half century or so. But, but let's just put those aside and use the, the earlier two as, as kind of typical um, early organizational efforts on, on what we mean about um, our, um, how we're going to develop and, and uh, objectify um, our development. So in essence, then, we lead into a rather interesting area of life called adolescence. What is adolescence? Well, there are a lot of different ways to define that. It's staggering when you actually get into the books and start reading about all the different ways in which it can be defined. But if you think about it from, from the view of society, there, there's an age cohort, as we defined it last time. There's a group of people who are adolescent in age. It's a period of soaring idealism. Uh, it may be viewed as, as a period of massive frustration, either with yourself or with others, as you begin to interact with the world in terms of, of your age. Um, it is a point of maximum intimate association with peers, more so at, at adolescence than, than at any other time in, in your life, basically. Uh, it is a period of dreams, ideals, and love, and it ends with, with the achievement of adult status, that, that adulthood is, is ever ahead of you as the, uh, as the goal. But let's look at that uh, in terms of a couple of different ways in which we can define it. If you define it biologically, you're defining it essentially as the years of human life between the onset of puberty and the completion of bone growth. And let me step aside there just a second to point out the vagueness of that definition. Because it's one thing to talk about the, the, um, the, the um, onset of puberty and the completion of bone growth. But if you think about completion of bone growth, uh, Hakeem Olajuwon was recruited out of the University of Houston, if I remember correctly, at about age 21. And yet when it was announced by the Rockets when he was recruited that he was going to play for them, his height was not listed as a height, it was listed as expected height. And that was fully another inch taller than he was at the time he was recruited. And really what was represented there is that having been recruited in his early 20s, it was anticipated, and in fact it was realized ultimately, that he had some more growing to do. Most of us don't tend to think of adolescence as stretching into the mid-20s. We tend to think of it as done at age 18 or 19. Uh, once you get into college, you're done with adolescence. But biologically, if you wanted to find it as the ceasing of bone growth, it actually stretches another five or ten years ahead of you in that case. So there is a, there's a grayness at the border, is what I'm suggesting here. Um, when we talk about an adolescent, we're talking about people in a general age range. But we tend to view it, most, probably for convenience, more often than not, we tend to define it simply as age. If you're, you're in the teenage years, you're an adolescent by definition, and we often don't tend to think about the fact that the technical definition stretches both ways, um, both directions, age-wise. Um, the other event um, that, that happens during this period, of course, is puberty, and that is the age of first being able to, to beget or to bear offspring. Um, legally, it's 14 for boys and, and 12 for girls. That's when it is statistically most likely to happen. But there's some evidence to suggest that that time may be creeping gradually earlier on us. You and I may not be alive by the time there's enough long longitudinal data to be able to answer that question. But there is some worry about the, the firmness of the definition, the, the younger end firmness that we're, we're dealing with here right now. Um, another way to define uh, adolescence is to define it instead psychologically, essentially as a time period of mixed responsibilities and abilities in which behavior is modified or adjusted from childlike to adult-like in any society. The longer I toy with that definition, the more I really don't like it. Because if you think about it, what I've really just told you is that you're, a, a, you're an adolescent. If you're not a child, you're not an adult. It's kind of defining by, by exclusion, essentially. You're not, your behavior is, it shifts from childlike to adult-like. 
And so in one sense, we're defining adolescence by the behavior of two other periods. And that just finds, strikes me as being a bit of a cheat. Um, everyone agrees what adolescence is, teenage years, but we have a lot of difficulty defining it precisely. So, so um, it, it certainly has a significant physiologically based onset, the ability to beget. Um, but if you look at the processes that are ongoing, then there are several different glands of the body uh, and their associated hormonal secretions that play a role. Increases in some, decreases in others. They all combine for a very significant gain in growth that has to be accompanied by an increase of control. And I'm gonna come back and talk about that um, in a little bit here. But if you think about it, um, the awkwardness that we often associate with, with adolescence is partly because the signal time, from the time a signal leaves the brain, I wanna lift my foot, it has to travel up to 50% further than it did as little as two or three years ago when leaving the brain to tell the foot to lift. And the result is that occasionally the signal doesn't arrive when it's expected to because the brain is still operating with an earlier image of, you know, I'm 12 years old and I'm this tall and this is when I need to lift my foot to get to the next step. But as they get bigger, that signal has to leave earlier so the foot is lifted earlier and the net result is they trip. And it's simply a timing problem. It doesn't have to, it isn't adolescence per se, it's the fact that their body has shifted ratios enough so that the timing is off. What they've always lived with suddenly doesn't work. And that can lead to the idea of, of that is awkwardness is one of the words that you'll often see um, um, associated with, with uh, adolescence. And it, it has only to do with the timing issue. They simply need to practice. Um, but there are a lot of different, um, We'll, we'll delay our discussion of, of physical development here until uh, a later discussion of, of humans as, as sexual beings, which we'll get to here in several different um, later lectures. But early on, when we look at the tasks for adolescence, it includes things like uh, bodily control, learning to, to come to grips with the awkwardness that they often manifest simply because they're still learning the timing to, to get things to, to function as they are supposed to. Um, we have tasks like peer identification. Um, size may cause trouble in defining exactly who you mean as your peers. Um, if you're late in maturing, you may be walking around sixth grade at, at four feet high, and there are other people, other kids who are early in maturing and, and same sex, they may be almost two feet taller than you. And it's kind of awkward to, to gather around with you being the only four footer among six footers in, in sixth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade, the age of, of kind of maximum size difference. But that's a problem. That's a challenge that adolescents have to come to grips with. What size am I in? What kind of a group am I going to fit into and how? Um, social sensitivity is an issue. They become, as, as I was just saying, they become increasingly aware of the reaction of others to them. And that is an, an element of, of what um, uh, adolescents have to, have to come to grips with. Um, the whole issue of self-organization. There is a reason why mom is on your case at 7.30 every morning to get your fanny out of bed, get fed, get dressed, and get out of here. Because the school bus leaves at a given time. And at some point, they have to self-assume responsibility for, for learning the importance of doing that kind of thing. Um, and then there is the, the overall growth of self-regulation. There is a reason why um, um, society has various laws of kind of increasing freedom that you gain as you age, uh, partly because of the seriousness of violating various kinds of rules. I'm thinking of here of drinking behavior, which is delayed a lot further than, for instance, voting behavior. Um, but in fact, those, those uh, freedoms are, are eventually awarded to people largely because of age. When you reach a given age, you're, you're entitled to that. But those are some of the early tasks of, of, or some of the tasks of early adolescence. We can look then at middle and late adolescence, uh, where you've got increasing self-awareness and self-reliance, emphasize the latter. Um, you're gaining emotional independence from your parents um, and strengthening of, of self-control. It is simply important to understand that, yeah, you got this nice big fat paycheck, but that doesn't mean you bop right out to the market and spend the whole thing, because you gotta feed yourself for two weeks or four depending on the, on the uh, nature of the extent of the, the, the inner check interval for you. But that's the kind of thing that, that really comes in middle and late adolescence, a growing understanding of, of the importance of, of maintaining control of things like money. Um, even to all of those things um, that we've listed, let's consider also that there's increased movement from inherited to environmental controls. That is, your parents play a big role at, at age 12 or 13. They play a declining and relatively small role by the time you're age 18 or 19. Um, 
the magnitude of the tasks undertaken by adolescents is of increasing complexity, not only individually for them, but also interaction-wise in terms of people who are disappointed if they don't do as they say they're going to in any particular project. Um, and so in essence, um, there are a lot of different changes going on physically, um, intellectually, during the course of, of adolescence. But then let's also look at um, some cognitive changes that take place during this interval. Um, these are often among the most significant changes occurring during adolescence, other than the change in growth. Um, I have a really nice demonstration that I like to, to use in introductory. It isn't directly relevant here, but it will make kind of the point that I'm trying to make here, and that is that if you look at the percentage change in growth that occurs in height or weight, doesn't matter which way you plot it, during adolescence, it pales by comparison to the absolute change in our body that takes place in the first three months after birth. If you look at it as a percentage figure, the curve is off the, off the graph in terms of magnitude of change percentage-wise that's occurring among youngsters. But it turns out, even absolutely, there is a greater change in poundage during the first three months of life than there is at any stretch in adolescence itself. So it is, it's a relative change. It is nonetheless a big one. Because as I said, you know, the timing of, of neurological impact on, on body is, is shifting and it takes practice. You simply have to operate with that bigger body a while to see what's going on. But there are also things going on in the head um, that, that are altered as, as a function of, of the age. Um, having moved from, from a more abstract form of, of cognition, adolescents spend much more time daydreaming, okay? than they did as, as uh, elementary school students. Um, they're railing against an unjust world. It is typically uh, high school students and, and college students who in fact uh, raise some of the major issues for society. Probably the, singest, the single biggest voice in objection to the U.S.'s involvement in the Vietnam conflict was raised on college campuses. I mean, that was a youth issue. But in fact, ultimately, it turned out the, the adolescents, the, the, the late adolescents, young adults, were right. I mean, they were right on target. And it turned out we shouldn't have been there. And, and ultimately, the country came to its sense and backed out. Um, but it was really out of adolescence that that objection, that, that caution, was first raised. So it is not to say that because you're young, the thoughts are themselves insignificant. There is a cognitive developmental process that's going on, um, oftentimes with, with world impact in, in terms of, of the cumulative effect. Um, but they become particularly incensed, I'm talking about adolescents in general, uh, when the controlling adults do not immediately adapt their ideas. In some cases, there are reasons for it, counter ideas or counter reasons why an idea is not adopted. But it is a, a kind of an inherent um, competition or sense of persecution built into adolescence. The ideas, in some cases absolutely sterling, are simply not adopted instantly by the adult world. Uh, and like everything else in this world, you have to have a political voice to really have an impact on, on what's going on. Um, but that can be frustrating, because when you're, when you're uh, bright enough and old enough to, to be part of society, still to be excluded because you don't have a representative, that can raise some rather interesting cognitive uh, problems. Um, Elkind, uh, David Elkind, has done some fascinating work of, over the past half century concerning how egocentrism impacts adolescence thinking uh, during the, the process of growing up, and he really describes two different forms of, of uh, adolescent uh, egocentrism, if you want to call it that, that creates a heightened level of self-consciousness and awareness of who one is. One of these is what's called an imaginary audience by, by Elkind. What he's talking about is, is a delusion that any of us can operate with in that age interval, um, that others are just as concerned about how the, the, um, the teen him or herself behaves and looks as they are viewing themselves, okay? It really isn't the case. The world is not that focused on your own behavior. I can remember at one point I was all hung up in, is still in high school, about the fact that people were sitting behind me looking at the back of my head. And I was constantly fidgeting with my hair to make sure everything was absolutely pristine, correct, and straight. And that was really an, an example of the imaginary audience to which I was playing at that time in my adolescence. Nobody else, I'm sure, even looked at the back of my head, let alone fussed about whether the hairs were crossed or not. But in the, in the imaginary audience, the teen, him or herself, is always the focus, always on center stage. Um, the consequences are that the, those concerns, when they're expressed, intensify during periods of stress. Because in, in the image that everybody is focused on me, if it isn't done exactly the way I want it, then it isn't being done correctly. And that leads to that increases the, the stress load that adolescents are, are subject to in this kind of thing. 
<coughs> excuse me, it can also lead to things of which adolescents are, are quite guilty as, as an age group, and that is uh, loudness or showing off. Those are very typically coming out of the, the imaginary audience. That is that in, in one sense, in showing off, the adolescent is really playing more to himself than the others, the others that he may be annoying or impacting in one way or another. But it's, it's um, given these kind of features of the intellectual growth of the adolescent, there are certain predicted changes in their behavior that do occur that impact the rest of us. Another thing that, that uh, Elkind identified was the idea that adolescents also have what is called a personal fable, okay? These are basically stories that adolescents develop and tell about themselves. They're based on, on a fundamental series of, of ideas which are, are unique to adolescents, and that is I am unique, I am invincible, I am protected from harm, I am protected from risk, I am protected even from death. And there is, um, that is one of the reasons that, that uh, the driving rules are, are stacked in such a way that, it's that, that you may be young and high ability, but if you're young, you're nailed. You're simply not going to get a driver's license until you reach uh, a given age defined socially. And, and society is constantly debating about that. Is it, is it too young? Does it need to be younger? Does it need to be older? Uh, but it all comes back to that what Elkind identified essentially is the personal fable. And that is that some of the, the, the data in insurance uh, tables is quite clear, and that is that the likelihood of act, having an accident is highest during the time when you're in, in uh, adolescence and, and young adulthood. <coughs> there is no doubt that that is the highest accident time period in terms of your age. It's in the first years of life, and there are many tragic examples of what essentially were a brake pedal that wasn't applied quite quickly enough uh, when a curve was approached and, and so forth. Um, and it just comes out of that, that uh, imaginary audience and particularly the personal fable. The adolescents, the late adolescents, young adults tend to think of themselves as, as being sheltered from harm and so forth. They're not. And when your car runs into a brick wall, there's pretty convincing evidence created in that situation. Getting people to realize that can sometimes be an issue. So in any case, through all this, what we're searching for is essentially a, uh, a sense of identity. In the, in the concept, um, the, this concept of self-identity is one for which Eric Erickson himself is, is perhaps best known. Um, it occurs without a single overt decision, our identity with, of, of self. Um, though many such decisions may be played in the imagination before the imaginary audience, carefully filtering through the, fab the personal fable. That is, we use that, that imaginary audience and the, the personal fable to develop a sense of self. We play imaginary scenes, what if I were to, and then imagine your interactions in, in a particular kind of, of situation. It occurs as the ultimate effect of, of um, innumerable little decisions over a number of years. Okay. But we all go through it. We make various decisions in terms of how we're going to act, how we're going to interact, and so forth. Um, is it a time of turmoil? Is a kind of a typical question to ask about adolescence. I mean, with all the physical changes that are going on, with all the cognitive changes I've talked about, um, and the growing pressures of, of approaching adulthood, it might seem very reasonable to think of adolescence as, as a period of storm and drang, as, as it has been captured, storm and stress, as, as one writer has, uh, has captured it. But the actual answer seems to be no. It's not a period of storm and stress. Adolescents, per se, do not view their lives. They're happy, essentially as a function of the society that they're in. They, it tends to be a very happy age, and so storm and stress is not really a key feature of, of adolescence. The behaviors that these, these fables um, unleash are legion, as I've kind of implied. Things like reckless driving, um, no consideration of the risks, risks of acquiring uh, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, or for that matter, of uh, begetting or of experiencing uh, pregnancy. Um, in the, in the rush of the moment, people don't tend to always think about that. Uh, I don't need to be cautious. Nothing can happen to me is kind of the implicit rule by which adolescents are operating uh, in, in these uh, very complex processes of physical and cognitive development. It is not an easy time to work through. They're busy. Um, and let me also then, I, I want to spend most of the rest of the time today looking at a, a model of adult development. Okay, and I'm going to kind of ease into this so you may get tired looking at it, but um, bear with me here because there's a reason I've got it up there. We have traditionally thought of adult humans uh, as maintaining a reasonably stable, predictable personality through most of their adult life. Pretty much 
you contact your great aunt so and so and she's the same person at 70 she is at 80. Uh, there's not much change going on there and in fact through your parents themselves if they're in their 30s or their 40s pretty much um, you know through high school they are pretty stable your appreciation for them may change but they themselves don't alter don't change that much um, so Freud thought of, of uh, personality as, as basically stabilized by the end of childhood. I mean, there was some wisdom to his idea that, that it's all done in terms of developmental changes that are likely to startle anybody, by the end of, of adolescence at least. Um, but in fact, Levinson has developed a, what he calls a model of adult development. And in essence, it's, it's based on interviews with adults. And the model is based on a series of, here we are again, stages. Basically, childhood and adolescence is one. Uh, early adulthood is the second one. Middle adulthood he identifies as a separate area for some reasons I'll develop here shortly, kind of interesting. And then finally, later adulthood, late adulthood. Um, what makes his theory particularly interesting is not only that he's developed our, our adult experience into uh, individual stages, but he also narrates uh, or identifies periods of transition. And he identifies those, interestingly enough, as being age 30, 40, 50 and 60, where you're transitioning from one stage into a kind of a different stage. And development for, for um, um, Levinson is essentially viewed as, as a continuous process uh, that requires constant adjustments of one sort or another. That's kind of the underlying premise on which the theory itself is based. And so if we look at the theory, um, it's basically predicated on, this is going to be an age curve on the left side. You'll see why this, how this hangs together here a little bit later. So we're kind of vaguely going to gloss over childhood and early adolescence and simply put a jagged line there. But childhood and adolescence are occurring here. The early adulthood transition is kind of what you're going through now. That is, you're in the process of moving out of your parents' home, or you may have already done so, into your own apartment, and facing the issues of how does the rent get paid, how does the garbage get hauled. I mean, there's an array of problems that you're quite aware of that go along with that. But that's um, one of the transitions that, that uh, Levinson is, is uh, talking about here. Um, and we look, um, what's happening is you're looking outward to an external task. That is, you're launching a career, a marriage, and potentially a family. Um, it's a period of action uh, in contrast to the idealism of adolescence, where you can sit around and ruminate about what should be or what ought to be, but you're not yet responsible for it, so maybe you don't have to directly do anything about it. Uh, but that's, it's a period of, of action in contrast to the idealism of adolescence when you move into uh, early adulthood. Special challenges for women are things like a much wider choice in, in modern times. Women today face many more choices than did their colleagues at, at an earlier age. Um, I mean, we glossed over a little earlier career, marriage, and family. But those are major decisions uh, weighing more heavily even on women than men. Uh, simply because women are going to be actively involved in all three of those if they choose to have a family um, after getting married. Uh, so then you've got the balance of how are we going to strike a balance between my career, which is just as much important as, as the uh, husband's career in, in the traditional uh, older model of, of marriage in, in the U.S., um, but all of those become action points. Um, the marriage itself, who you're going to choose, and whether or not to start a family. One of the things that we see happening now is that the tendency, the average age uh, of women at first birth is going steadily upward. Uh, some have argued that it's up as high as 35 now. It is clearly beyond uh, mid-20s when it was uh, a century or more ago. Uh, the age of birth, at, uh, the age of the parent at first birth uh, tends to be markedly older now. May it be the financial pressures that we feel we are under, uh, the uncertainty of society itself. It's hard to know, but the, the change has been significant and steady going on over the last century or so, that the age of first, at first birth is going steadily upward, and, and there's no evidence at the moment that it's, that it's flattening off at all. Um, but women face a lot of different kinds of challenges, and that is the, the, they really face a constant readjustment between family and family needs versus career and career needs. Um, the age at which the family is started is, is growing, as, as but one example of that. To give you a specific figure, over half of the women with children aged one have paid jobs outside the home. And that is a stage that we have only reached in about the last 10 years. Let me give that to you again. Over half of women with children aged one 
have paid jobs outside the home. Over 50% of mothers, first mothers, first year of life, have a job outside the home. That puts a lot of pressure decision-wise on, on women, uniquely so on, on women. What that leads into then is essentially for both men and women a, a, um, an age 30 crisis, kind of age 30 to 34. And so we go through the, the, um, the early adult era and that's doing things like the, 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 the aspect of entering adulthood, relatively simplistic, but, but uh, the transition that's being posed is, is, is one at age 30. Um, and essentially the kind of issue that, that uh, Levinson says is being posed here is what is life all about now that I've done what I'm supposed to do? You know, at some point you kind of look around at age 25 or 30 and begin to say, okay, now what? I mean, I've done everything they told me to, now what? Um, many divorce. There's a surprising growth or, or ripple in, in increase in, in divorce in the mid 20s, um, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, many divorces, there are some career changes um, as of a change, almost implying the idea that a change has to be made now if it's ever gonna be, because I'm, I'm more flexible now. And there is a certain amount of wisdom to that. That is, as, as your responsibilities to others increase, the trade-off there is you lose a certain amount of flexibility. You lose the ability to, to, um, to, to have quite as many options as you might think you do at any given time. Um, the heart of, of the early adult era is, is basically a period of, of stability. It emphasizes making it in the adult world. And that leads on into then the, the, um, the, the midlife crisis, which is going to be a uh, transition, I should say, not crisis, um, around age 40. For women, uh, children may be beginning to leave home either for school, and that of course obligation to be home when the school bus arrives, but, but also more generally, um, if kids are being sent away to school, uh, you're already as an adult into a, a kind of a midlife transition that is fairly significant. I'm referring here to things like the empty nest syndrome, uh, which often is used to label the situation where children, the last child leaves the house uh, in, in later adulthood. Um, but they're also changing nature of, of demands on women as mother. Uh, role expectations are shifting in, in society, uh, but they're also shifting in your own personal life as, as your children age. The demands on them are not quite as high. Uh, it takes more parental involvement to run a Cub Scout troop than it does a Boy Scout troop, simply because you can turn to the, to the youngsters uh, for more help as, as they age. And that is reflected in parent life, too. As you age, there's less specific demand on you have to do this, that, and the other thing to make things happen. And the result is that, that as you look at uh, women aging who have stepped out of, of the uh, market in order to, to raise a family, you will often find women re-entering, resuming an interrupted career uh, once the children are, are successfully launched. Um, with, and the, the, what attends that is, is an increased emphasis on the job and its demands and in fact in some cases even seeking a new job. They've had time enough to, to sit at home as they're raising their family, contemplating their own life, what, what am I looking for by way of a job? And that will show up as some amount of change in, in job seeking in this situation. For men, during this interval, age 40, uh, 40 to 50, um, 80% of them will report that they have examined their lives extensively, critically, during that period, essentially similar to, to Erickson's seventh stage generativity. They're making an active decision about how they want to continue contributing uh, to, to life. And if it isn't resolved successfully, that is with a clear root of desire, a reason to head in a particular direction, the net result then is that you, you fall to the other side of, of Erickson's continuum there, a uh, challenge, and that is stagnation, uh, bored self-indulgence, okay? The, um, um, a middle-aged steel worker who has always been a steel worker might fall prey to that kind of a, a situation where the job just, I mean, the job is mastered cold um, and, and there's no challenge, essentially. He's, he is, is simply fulfilling the steps required by the job itself, and that has a certain downward pressure on, on uh, enthusiasm. Um, the middle life era then is, is um, leading toward um, greater stability than, than has been known at any other time. And, and the 50s traditionally tend to be um, what, what uh, Levinson is, is labeling here as the, as the midlife, um, middle adult uh, era. 
um, when you're entering middle adulthood, again, no great step here, uh, but there's a transition that's going on age-wise in terms of responsibility and so forth. I can cite a number of different examples for you, but if you look at the, the people who are department heads around the university here, that is somebody who has been elected by his colleagues, her colleagues, whichever, um, into a position in, in, of administration in the university. And if you look at the major leaders of the university, anywhere from department head on up, it is very rare to see people that don't have some element of silver in their hair. Uh, graying is, is, the, is the idea that I'm raising there. But that's a, a case, just one example in an environment you would understand, and that is a university, where the, the, um, the growing, you're growing towards stability. You typically, in an organization, don't want a fractious leader. You want one who has a, a sense of the past um, and a sense of mission that people can identify with. So it's a complex kind of role. Um, but it is, it is dependent on experience, having, having grown through the, the life of the organization and understanding what its members are, are interested in. Um, and that's, that's why some of these words that you hear me using here show up in, in the description of, of the later adult years. Um, and that is the, the um, transitioning that leads into uh, middle and, and later adulthood um, is, is a period that is marked by increasing evidence of, of stability. Um, later adulthood then, um, you're going to sense a disagreement here with, with some of what uh, White and Lloyd um, done and, and um, the author who I can never remember are advocating um, here, and, and I'm just going to leave it to you to, to work this out. But essentially, in the, in the uh, later adult transition, there are two rare, very interesting processes that go on, and this has been shown in a lot of different ways. Um, and that is one of them, as you're in the process of moving toward retirement from an organization, one of the things that may happen is what's called withdrawal which is a sociological process in which society is basically backing away from older adults in, in positions of responsibility. Assignments are given to other or younger workers. We'll, we'll let Sam Jr. run this next project. Uh, don't worry about it, he's under your control, but we'll let him take care of it, simply because you're planning on retiring in three years and this is a seven year effort, so we want to maintain continuity of leadership and so on, all sorts of different reasons, but the net effect is the company is backing away from its senior people. Uh, job change becomes harder. It's much harder for, harder for, for somebody to change job in mid-50s than it was in mid-40s, certainly than mid-30s. And it's simply because you're, you know, it's, it, one of the things companies are looking at is if we hire her, she's likely to, to retire on us. So we'll spend all this money training her up and, and then uh, she'll retire, or he's likely to move or he's really moving toward retirement. This is a stepping tone toward retirement. There are all sorts of, those kind of factors contribute to job change being essentially harder. It's strictly illegal. What's happening there is what's called age discrimination. And there are federal laws against that, but proving that it's going on is essentially impossible. I mean, you know it's going on, you can see it happening. There's just no way to prove it because there's nothing in paper, there's nothing in writing, there's nothing, nothing demonstrable other than the net effect on the individual. But with withdrawal is a kind of an invidious but typical sociological process that's going on. And I'm not faulting sociologists, it's, it's simply a sociological, it's a group process that we're all guilty of participating in. Um, the other is a more healthy kind of change that may also occur, and that is essentially disengagement. That, unlike withdrawal, is a psychological process. That is what's going on there is that the, the uh, person is preparing for retirement by scripting his or her own exit. That is, they are taking, for instance, not so many positions of leadership. They, they are ex relaying their expertise, essentially, to younger people. They're training up the next level of management in the company or in the organization, and they're passing that knowledge on. Um, the the um, situation there is then that, that what I'm arguing over that continuum through, through adulthood is that withdrawal and disengagement tend to represent two kind of diverse, you might even think of them as extremes on a continuum, moving from one where the company simply backs away from you to, to one where you actively withdraw from the, from the organization. I would cite, for instance, the University of Houston as, as having a really um, helpful retirement process. I'm not suggesting I'm stepping into retirement here at all, but I've, I've you know, like many of us have, I've taken the time to look ahead and see what's coming. And they have, uh, the state uh, through the University of Houston has what's called a VMOE program, a Voluntary Modification of Employment Program. 
and for senior faculty who wish to step into it, it's a magnificent kind of vehicle because what it does is essentially, you know, the traditional role of a professor is teaching, research, and service, essentially equal quantities of each, uh, 90 hours a piece um, all week long. Um, but in fact, the VMOE program does one th two things, actually. It cuts your pay by 50 point zero 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 one percent that is one penny or more less than half of your salary and it alters the uh, responsibilities that you shoulder and that is it shifts you strictly to teaching you can continue doing research if you're productive in it but your evaluation is only based on teaching that's the key component in the voluntary modification of employment the net result is that those plans t they're negotiable but but the typical ones run as much as five years and stepping from fully engaged in teaching research and service a five-year interval is a very comfortable mattress on which to lower oneself down uh, in, in gradually backing away from, from the organization. So yeah, the, the organization in some way officially is initiating a withdrawal policy, but it's five years in length and, and by mutual negotiation. And it has um, uh, a, a very soft exit um, laid out to it. I find it, as, as I've looked at various kind of universities and, and organizations around the world, to be a really very enlightened policy that our university offers for its, uh, for its senior faculty. And I know a number of colleagues who've done it. I can only think of one who's actually actually gone through all five. Um, and so what it's really saying is that it does have the intended effect, and that is that, that it provides a, a way to shift from, from the over-engaging, and it is really an over-engaging kind of teaching, research, and service demand, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, into retirement, which is essentially you're on your own. Um, and that, that uh, VMOE is, is one rather interesting combination of both uh, withdrawal and disengagement packaged in, in a, a rather helpful plan. So let's press on here, and I don't know how much we can finish of, of what remains here, but we've got a bunch yet to look at, one of which is aging. And by that, what I mean is um, this is not going to be a particularly knock-your-socks-off kind of definition, but aging is essentially the biological process of growing older. Um, aging often seems to have a negative emphasis implying physical and, and functional deterioration. Um, and yet aging clearly involves not only physical changes, but also changes in our skills even our interpersonal skills. But let me in fact show you the basis for that, that model that often is, is suggested, you know, kind of a, a gradual, aging by some is viewed as a kind of a descent into senility. We could think of it that way if you want. Let me suggest the following. What I'm gonna argue is that the vast majority of people do not descend from, from some peak efficiency, however you wanted to find it, into senility. It doesn't happen that way. What usually goes on if you plot any given person's life is that instead, what happens is that they move from 100% efficacy through something like a stroke or a heart attack or some major, major physical altering event into a life that is significantly reduced, however you want to define that, in terms of what they can do, what they're expected to do, what they want to do. Okay? I would argue that, in fact, that sudden shift and it tends to occur fairly rapidly, I'm talking over months, not years, tends to occur fairly rapidly, certainly not during the course of, of the entire life, okay? And that in fact, the reason we end up with this averaging curve, as indicated in the pink there, is because if you add together all of those events, those significant changes in living style do tend to, to gang up on us. They're more likely to happen to older people than younger people. But really all that's saying is that across the population as a whole, the likelihood or the point at which that, that descent into inability or, or lack of fully productive life is more likely to occur later in life than earlier in life. And given that, each individual is plotted this way. So when you take all of the individual descents from perfection to something less, and you average it, you end up with the pink curve. But that pink curve really does not represent an average in that case. It simply does not describe the average adult's life. Talk to any 70-year-old, 80-year-old. That simply is not the way they will describe their life. They'll talk about some major time at which they made a change. Okay. So what I would argue is that instead, the way we ought to plot this is something like the blue curve. And that is that there may be some individual point at which you're going to shift from significant ability and responsibility to a lowered, maybe even a markedly lowered event. But where that occurs is really what we ought to be looking at. I'm suggesting that the, that the model that, that leads to aging um, 
recognizes the benefits of aging in appointment to, to senior leadership position and so forth, but it doesn't really, the, the physique doesn't drop in the same way that dramatically grew during adolescence. There isn't a sudden fall off. There is a, a gradual descent in, in physical ability, but it is not reflected even in working ability. That the work environment itself is reflected in that relatively sudden drop in, in overall responsibility. And when that will happen, the reason you have insurance policy is to pray that it happens later, and medical policy. But you, it, it tends to happen at varying times through the adult life, and that averaging of that, inappropriate averaging, leads to the wrong picture. We'll finish our discussion at the beginning of the next lecture.